Acapulco, Mexico. This is Anarchast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a returning guest coming in from Hartford, Connecticut. I always remember Hartford for the Hartford Whalers. I'm a hockey fan, uh, but most of you probably have never heard of it. It's not important. It's actually Edward Stringham coming in from Trinity College. Uh, I actually had him on Anarchast a few months ago. Excellent interview. We'll put a link to it somewhere, and uh, you can check that out. But the reason I wanted to have Edward back on is because he actually wrote an article, uh, excellent article, uh, about the police state and how we can deal with it. As, as everyone knows, there's a massive problem in the U.S. and actually many countries, but the U.S. is by far the worst uh, of just cops going around and killing people and killing dogs and all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, Edward wrote an excellent article called Is America Facing a Police Crisis? And the Wall Street Journal, it somehow got past all the propaganda censors because he's got a lot of free market uh, sensibilities in this uh, article uh, got in. And there's so many things to talk about in the article because Ed, uh, Edward brought up so many great points. And I'll just start with one point that I, I thought was interesting that I hadn't quite heard before put in this way. He brought up the point that in 2015, 41 officers were slain in the line of duty. Uh, that means the 900,000 U.S. law enforcement officers face a victimization rate of 4.6 deaths per 100,000 overseers or officers. And any number, he says, any number greater than zero is a tra tragedy. But the average American faces a nearly identical ho homicide rate of 4.5. And the average male actually faces a homicide rate of 6.6. .6. So in actual fact, uh, police officers get killed less than your average person. Uh, so uh, you put in all kinds of amazing stats like this, Edward. So I just want to let you start off and just uh, talk about what you talked about in the article. Uh, thanks, Jeff. It's a really kind of an emotional issue. Uh, when you bring it up, half the people say, oh, this is a big problem, uh, police violence. And then the other half of the people say, oh, if you're criticizing police, you're advocating crime. And it's really kind of become very bifurcated, a lot of very emotional arguments. So what I kind of do is take a step back as an economist, and I said, well, let's just look at the magnitudes here. And as I mentioned, uh, and you quoted, uh, the amount of police that get killed is uh, not that high, actually. But it turns out they actually, uh, at the same time, kill 1,207 people last year, which is one out of 12 people who get killed in the United States are getting killed by the police. So there's a lot of pro-police defenders and they say, oh yeah, police killings is really rare. Uh, but one out of 12 is quite, to me, a quite a uh, shocking number. I really didn't uh, you know, think about that until I did the calculations. The police are actually one out of 360 uh, people in the United States, yet they kill one out of 12 people in the United States, which is really kind of uh, uh, quite out of the norm. If we look at that in England and in Germany, police represent this almost similar per percentage of the population. They kill less than one half of 1%. So you've got these people in the United States killing lots and lots of people, and they're basically, unfortunately, in many cases, completely unaccountable for it and just getting away with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's because the whole system, they are part of the system. The police essentially are there to protect the system, the political system, and enforce their laws, their arbitrary laws on people. So whenever they do do something that's really heinous, and they do it all the time, it's, it's pretty much literally daily something heinous is done by a, a cop. Uh, what happens? Well, the cops look into it. <laughs> well, right. well how, do you how do you think that's going to work out? And then if it even gets so far as to go to a court, if there's enough public outcry, especially if someone caught video of how brutal some of these murders really are that they commit, uh, if it goes to a court, well, who's the court? Well, the court is the government. Uh, the judge is the government. Now, they say they can have a jury, but for the most part, the jury uh, are so brainwashed with government propaganda in their schools and the mainstream media programming and plus the judge and the lawyer and then even the lawyer the prosecutor he works for the government so the the the, the tables are so tilted in their favor uh, that most of the time when a cop does something absolutely horrible he just gets a paid vacation right yeah so in the essay which I got actually I was quite I was quite surprised I got like nearly two full pages and I went through and I reviewed uh, four books and one of them I thought was was great um, and it's by this guy named Norm Stamper who used to be a police chief of Seattle actually 
And he goes through and documents uh, his experience as a uh, starting out as a regular beat cop, working as a police chief uh, of Seattle. And he talks about how the police are averse to telling uh, on their colleagues if somebody does something wrong. They never want to tell on their colleagues because uh, if you do, you're kind of uh, seen as like an outcast within the department. They might not. Uh, back you up. They might perform what he says are cruel, practical jokes, uh, sometimes dangerous ones against you. And so the police are very averse to telling on their friends. And then at the same time, prosecutors are uh, theoretically a different branch of the law enforcement system, but the prosecutors work very closely with the police. They require them to testify. Uh, he goes through in this book and he, he quotes another police chief who says uh, tens of thousands of police per year uh, engage in perjury at the stand, uh, what they call testilying. And they do so because the prosecutors and the police need to work together in unison to get convictions. So the idea that the uh, police and the prosecutors are somehow independent or objective, it's just not the case. In many cases, the judge, who's allegedly this third party arbitrator, uh, is also working for the uh, same exact system, being paid by the exact same people. And in many cases, they have the same exact objectives, is to help get uh, uh, convictions. So in Ferguson, where uh, we've heard a lot about in the news, there are a lot of you know, terrible things going on there the past couple of years, uh, there's a report of the police department and by the Department of Justice just going through the standard practices and it's really quite horrifying just to read this is a government document uh, basically doing an audit of themselves and it's really horrifying they just talk about how the uh, government law enforcement is used to extract resources from the public uh, giving criminal fines for everything like even having an overgrown lawn you can get a, uh, an arrest warrant for. In a city of 20,000 people, they had 9,000 arrest warrants issued in one year. Uh, so the idea that the law enforcement is somehow separate, distinct, uh, they unearth emails where they say, hey, can you help us increase revenue for the, for the government for this year? Can you ramp up your tickets? And I say, yeah, we'll see what we can do. Um, so totally divorced from the idea of serving and protecting, which the police lead us to believe that's what they're into. Yeah, absolutely. It's called the thin blue line. And uh, there's a lot of talk about, oh, there's 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 good cops. Uh, actually, it's impossible to be a good cop. Uh, first of all, you're being paid by extorted stolen money, which is taxes. Uh, you're working in a communist style, centrally planned system. So you're also kind of like a communist. Uh, then you're enforcing arbitrary edicts uh, against uh, people who have cr c committed no crime against anyone else, uh, victimless crimes, which is a large percentage of the crimes that they uh, go after people with guns with. Uh, so just by that fact alone, there is no such thing as a good cop. It's not possible. And there's no such thing as good government cop. There's a, a good thing, a, such a good thing as a private security or things like that, but no such thing as a good cop. And then as you pointed out, and I've heard way worse stories than what that Seattle police chief uh, pointed out, uh, when there is sometimes some uh, cop who has some morality and he sees a cop who's going around just brutally uh, beating up people and stealing their money and raping people and all that kind of stuff, if he speaks up, they usually get run out of that department in a matter of no time, if not uh, death threats, if not actually get killed themselves. Uh, this is a very nefarious organization, which is sort of how it always works out when it's this communist centrally planned monopoly sort of a system, isn't it? There's, there, there's never any incentive to improve their service, and I don't even want their service to begin with, but if, uh, if uh, there is no incentive as opposed to the private market, where if you had a private security firm and he was beating up your kids every day, you'd be like, you're fired, uh, but you can't do that with the cops. Yeah, so a lot of conservatives are uh, sometimes critical of certain aspects of the government and oh, the unionized uh, officials are unaccountable. But when it comes to the police, they somehow are like, nope, 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 not in the case of the police. The police, even though they're unionized and they uh, can't be held accountable, we know for a fact that they're acting on the behalf 
of the public. And there's just like this total disconnect between their thinking elsewhere, uh, when it, but when it comes to the police. No, the police are beyond reproach. And also in the uh, a book by uh, Norm Stamper, the former police chief, he basically says it's just the way they're set up they're incubators for racism. Police departments are incubators for racism, incubators for violence, incubators for just mistreatment of people. As you mentioned, if you're a business and you're mistreating your customers, you lose your customers. You know, the restaurant that's a jerk is not going to have any diners anymore. The store that is being rude to the patrons is not going to have any uh, customers coming back. With police, in contrast, they're financed two ways. One is taxes. Right? They're paid regardless of how well they're doing. And the other thing is how much money they can collect through things like uh, fines or also through asset forfeiture. So starting in the 1990s, uh, some laws were changed such that police can now forfeit assets without even having to petition a judge or show any probable cause of, uh, a, of, of guilt or anything like that. Uh, they'll take those assets. It's, it's theoretically possible for certain people to get those back in court, uh, but that's a whole big legal proceedings. In many cases, uh, the value of what they're targeting is, is worth uh, less than well, the cost it would be to get it back in court. And so people just have their assets taken. And it's increased so much that now the value of asset forfeiture actually exceeds the value of all private burglaries <laughs> in the United States. So people talk about, oh, well, what if we didn't have government? We're going to have crime. We're going to have burglaries. And I'm like, yep, we are going to have burglaries. But now we're having more, double the amount of burglaries <laughs> than if we didn't have this policy. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. Uh, just uh, the amount of asset forfeiture, as they call it, which is just theft. It's absolute theft. And uh, as you pointed out, it's more than all private burglaries. So for those conservatives out there who are like, well, I've watched all these uh, uh, cop shows my whole life on the television programming, so I think they're all really great. Uh, it's like, well, just look, look at what they're doing. And I saw a great meme the other day that said something about, uh, it was, it was, a, it was uh, targeted at conservatives who like cops, and it said something along the lines of, uh, you don't think the government should take away your guns, but you, do you know who's going to actually be the ones who come to take away take them away from you? It will be the police. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. uh, they'll, they'll get it good and hard, just like all democracies. I think it was Mencken who said that or someone who said <laughs> they're going to get it good and hard of what they want, and they're, they're getting it. And it is pretty sad. And uh, you pointed out about how uh, they just have no incentive uh, to uh, do well. And actually, I've seen numerous cases. These are all pretty much proven. Of course, they're not proven in a government court because, of course, government's never going to convict itself, as we found out with Hillary Clinton recently. Huh. Uh, but uh, numerous riots. For example, I was up in Vancouver. Or actually, I wasn't up there. Uh, I used to live in Vancouver, but I, I was up there for the riot before that. There's always a hockey riot whenever they lose the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs of uh, the finals in Vancouver. So I was there for the first one. The second one, it was actually proven. The, the cops lit their uh, police car on fire to start a riot. Oh, and no. the reason is, well, the reason is because uh, they get more money. So if they get this big riot going and they had a big one up there in Vancouver a couple of years ago, the next year their budget goes way up. It's the exact opposite incentives yeah. of a free market enterprise. Yeah, that's right. So the drug war especially gives them a lot of, uh, you know, free stuff to do and really gives them a lot of authority to search people and, and say, well, you're doing that, you're doing that. Uh, Warrantless stop and frisk, for example, in New York City was uh, a, a very big problem. And it basically, they gave themselves the authority to uh, stop people without any, uh, you know, any probable cause, without any warrant. And that was eventually kind of uh, uh, found to be illegal, uh, given that, um, you know, the vast majority of these people were completely innocent. And, uh, but it's like, oh, the government loves to get all this free, free stuff to do, free time to do, uh, to harass different people, that uh, their, their budgets actually increase. In uh, the 1990s, there was this huge crime bill passed by Bill Clinton, and it, it said, oh, you know, what we need to do is have more community police. And really what it did was it gave billions of dollars from the federal government, federal taxpayers, you and I, and, uh, and not me, so, I don't pay taxes. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, took my <laughs> well, money. We'll see what happens to me, but uh, to, uh, I refuse. <laughs> to, uh, well, I pay all my taxes to hire uh. these police. And uh, they basically um, 
increased the number of police by 100,000 over this time period. And they also authorized transferring hand-me-downs from the military. And so now, and then also modern programs for the Department of Homeland Security. The federal government is giving local police departments money to buy the equivalent of assault weapons, uh, what look to be uh, weapon, uh, vehicles of war, uh, mine resistant vehicles, uh, grenade launchers, all these Apache things. Apache helicopters. Yeah, all these things that you, you know, expect to see in some video game or, or in uh, the news about some war in, in the Middle East. Now we have standing armies financed by the federal government on American soil. So a lot of people say, oh, well, policing is a local issue, it's a local government. Well, they're marching to the tune of federal government who's gotten more and more involved and made it more militarized. Uh, the local police love this stuff. They love getting uh, camouflage and say, look, hey, look at us, we're just like G.I. Joe. Uh, the idea that police need uh, camouflage, this is like something designed to be in the jungle or the forest. <laughs> Uh, if anything, they need to have camouflage to, to look like Starbucks or something. Um, but uh, instead, it's like, you know, look at how tough we are. Uh, and it's really, really perverse, the whole system uh, where they get to have these military weapons and use them against uh, Americans with, with them being the judge, jury, and executioner. Yeah, I think there's something in the U.S. Constitution, which it doesn't exist anymore, called posse comitatus, which essentially means you're not allowed to have the military just roaming the streets in, yeah. the, in the country. So they said, OK, well, we'll just make the cops the military now. Exactly, exactly. So that was one of the reasons for the uh, American Revolution. It's like, we don't want this. And uh, well, OK, fine. It's technically illegal. But uh, the, if I see somebody who's financed by the federal government, uh, armed by the federal government, it's like, okay, are the, what is the practical difference uh, between the local police force who's marching around in military formation uh, uh, with military weapons, using them against the, the public? Um, the idea that, that government police are here to serve and protect, it kind of goes out the window when we have things like the, quote, war on drugs. Uh, whenever they use the word war, that it implies there's enemy combatants, and that's basically meaning the public, people in the public, are enemy combatants, and when the government is viewing people as enemy combatants, that's a major, major problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I know in your article, and when you emailed me, you said, I think I'm the first person who's mentioned private policing in the Wall Street Journal, and they probably are. I have never heard of anyone else even mention it before. I've had on uh, Dale Brown of Threat Management uh, in Detroit, who's got a private security mm, firm. That's and great. They, it's absolutely, if you haven't seen that Anarchist, please check it out. It's here. Or it's, it's in one of these places. Just press the button wherever it is. Uh, it's absolutely, it's night and day. It's, exact, it's It's how it should be. And uh, he's a growing massively actually threat management which is great great news uh, yeah. people are starting to wake up to uh, we got to get rid of this government centrally planned communist style extortion financed uh, public policing uh, and uh, find different ways and that's one of the ways and there's also other ways uh, technology is making it so I've also had an anarchist with virtual Vaduva of cell 411 and that's a way that you can have on your phone uh, you could get all your friends on there and you can even hire uh, private security firms so instead of calling 911 you use cell 4 one one and you get uh, you know you people who actually know you showing up if you have a medical emergency or anything and actually the number one use the of cell 411 is when people get pulled over by the cops everyone uses it to start uh, streaming video uh, because as we know that's one of the most dangerous situations you can be in in the US is when you get uh, pulled over or detained by the police yeah so I like the example of the private firm that you mentioned in uh, Michigan, where they're all about de-escalation and, and, and trying to minimize uh, conflict, minimize violence. That's really the, the goal of uh, a safe society, is to minimize uh, crime and violence. And the police are not taught that. The police, in many cases, escalate things. Uh, it's not part of their training. They're trained to uh, protect themselves, or, or that's just their, maybe their own instincts taking over. Um, but there was this uh, quite amazing, um, it was a, an analysis, I think it was in the Washington Post the other day, of five gun experts uh, analyzing these, these videos of police 
shootings. And there was one lady from the Los Angeles Police Department. Every single one she saw where it was like them shooting what I would say, and every other, <laughs> most of the other people said that there were innocent people. She was like, well, you know, the police had to do that because that toy truck that that guy had could have been a gun. And, uh, you know, just like shoot, na shoot first, ask questions later. It's very, very, very troubling to see that. Uh, they don't. They don't have the uh, well-being, the safety of those they're protecting, uh, in many cases, at all on their uh, objective function. It's all about let's, let's you know, maximize the well-being of the police and forget everybody else. Norm Stamper in that book, he said, he said uh, one of his colleagues very early on, he said, you can't let feelings get in your way. And uh, he was given arrest quotas, uh, ticket quotas. And he said within a short period of time, he just got sucked into the whole system where policing, the people on his beat, they were irrelevant to him. Yeah, absolutely. They actually have a phrase that's used often in the police called officer safety first. Uh, so they, yeah. number one is to make sure that we're okay. And you can see that. You can see a guy, so you see on YouTube every now and then, a guy has like a little a little knife or something. He's freaking out because he lives in a police state and it's totally evil society based on taxation and extortion and theft and, and murder. And he's he's having a bad day and he pulls out a little, a little tiny knife and you can see like 50 cops all surround him with battle gear. Yeah. And, you know, and they, they, if he even just moves, they just all start firing. And they, they don't even stop after one or two. We're talking like 60, 100 bullets that this guy is just lying on the ground. Like, it's very obvious. And actually, there was I think there was a Supreme Court case or something where, which came out recently, which said, it came out in the case, that the police have no obligation or duty to protect the public. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really unbelievable and quite sad if, if you want to go through some of those videos. There was another one of... Uh, a Native American Indian uh, woodcarver uh, of many generations, and he was walking uh, down the street, and he had uh, a wooden block, which uh, apparently he had used for wood carving, and he had his wood carving knife, which was away, and the police, <clears throat> oh, he also was hard of hearing in one ear, and the police came up to him from behind and said, hey, hey, Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Within that entire thing, I had almost recreated perfectly. Within five seconds of the first hey, uh, the police started shooting at him uh, from behind. And it's like very, very disturbing. In this particular case, the uh, family of this gentleman got uh, uh, you know, damages. But in, in many other cases, these police are completely unaccountable and they don't have to pay for it if there's damages the taxpayers pay for it so it's like the worst yeah, of all worlds it's the worst i know it's crazy they do all this crazy stuff and the only thing that can really happen is the taxpayers pay even more money uh, yeah. to deal with what they did yeah so i mean <laughs> I, I i'm i'm an advocate of just you know markets 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 privatize 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 uh, but for those people who, you know, just are in love with the police, um, maybe at least require them to get insurance of, uh, you know, when they kill people. And uh, if they start killing too many people, it's going to be clear that, that their uh, uh, insurance premiums are through the roof. And that'll, like, at least, you know, get them to see, like, oh, you know, maybe uh, we need to put a price on uh, our willy-nilly killing of people. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't think that's actually going to do much because ultimately... Well, actually, the, the police and the local sheriffs, I believe, have to have some sort of insurance. And there's been a number of cases of the, uh, certain of ones of these uh, departments or whoever they are uh, doing uh, so many things that their insurance company says, we're not going to insure you anymore. We're oh. losing too much money. Yeah. And they actually had to shut down the police department because <laughs> of it. So, so, so we should definitely know. demand yeah. that. All right. Uh, it's yeah, a good and, step. You know, for people watching this, I know so many people are finally realized, I've been talking about this for a long time, but a lot of, it's coming into so many people's lives now, and it's becoming so obvious, and it's so many, there's so many smartphone cameras now that people are seeing so much of this. People are waking up, and I'll tell you, if you're watching this, you're wondering, what's the solution? I'll give you the solution right now. It's going to be hard, uh, but uh, stop paying taxes, stop using Federal Reserve notes, stop using the money that is of the government that the Federal Reserve makes, which is what finances all they do, start using things like 
Bitcoin, gold, and silver. Uh, stop uh, voting. Uh, stop uh, obeying authority. Uh, so if you're crossing the street and jaywalking is what they call it, so there's just no cars and you're crossing and a guy tells you to stop, just keep walking, you'll probably get killed. But, <laughs> you know, that's why I said it's not going to be easy, but that's the way to get rid of it. And then start to uh, find local private security agencies, like people like Dale uh, Brown of Threat Management. He's expanding all over the place. Try to even find or even start one up in your local area. Then get cell 411 on your uh, phone and then use that instead of 911. And as Flavor Flav already knew back 20 years ago, 911 is a joke of uh, Public Enemy. He did a whole video on that, a whole music video. Uh, if we did all that, we'd get rid of all this stuff pretty quick. Uh, I know most people aren't ready for that, but I just want to let people know that is probably the solution and it would actually be so much better. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of privatization. Um, uh, I do, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I pay my taxes and I do have to finance all these things that I don't like. I'll mention one uh, particular example which I found uh, particularly offensive but, but just interesting of the mindset of, of uh, some of these people, which is a new statue in uh, New York City which is a, uh, uh, by the 9-11 memorial, which is a statue for first responders. Um, and it's basically a, a galloping horse, um, and you got on it this very macho-looking police man, and he's got some like big, like uh, you know, military uh, uh, weapon, and that's really the, the, the mentality of these people is like, yeah, we're here, we're gonna come in with our guns up and uh, uh, start shooting terrorists out of the sky, stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's a real sad. Uh, thing the 9/11, um, but there's nothing that those first responders could have done if they showed up on that horse with that, with that uh, you know weapons drawn. And those are the types of things that that I have to pay for. Um, uh, lots of my money is going to these things, which which I don't I don't support. I don't support uh, them killing one out of 12 Americans who get killed. But you know there's. There's no way, given that I pay my taxes, no way I could just say, hey, you know what, maybe we should have a little bit less violent police force. With markets, you can direct your money to whomever you want. If, if you want to choose somebody who's more uh, peaceful, more, more um, uh, gentle, uh, into de-escalating, you, you can do that in markets, but you can't do that with government. Government is this course of monopoly. They're there in many cases, they, they, they like the conflict as you mentioned, and it gives them authority and these people, you know, they're, they're, they're unionized uh, government officials and they love it. It's like, cool, yeah, I get to do all this neat stuff, shoot at people, and I'm gonna get paid regardless. I'm gonna get paid based on my seniority with the office. Uh, in San Francisco, sorry, in California, there's this thing called pension spiking, where they get, um, I forget the exact amount, I think it's 90% of their peak year salary when they retire. And so right before they retire, they wanna get this really cushy job. And then they retire, tons of them making over $200,000 per year uh, so more than doctors, more than people on Wall Street, uh, well, maybe not Wall Street, but more than uh, most people. And, you know, these are people who retire in their early 50s, and then they get that pension for the rest of their entire uh, lives or their survivors' lives. And it's a great, you know, it's a, basically an extortion scheme, scheme, I have to say, where they've set it up for themselves or they're getting paid a lot, and there's really no ac accountability. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's not going to stop until people wake up. So that's why I should share this video, uh, let people know. Uh, the more people know that there is other options, the more that we can change things. It's not going to change overnight, unfortunately, and we're going to go through really bad times uh, during the process, but it's going to be really bad if we just let this keep going. It's going to get worse and absolutely worse uh, as this sort of communist central plan system goes on. So pass this on to your uh, conservative friends who like the cops. Tell them you are com communist sympathizers. Uh, you really like centrally planned uh, uh, government uh, uh, sort of things. <laughs> uh, and, and you know they, they have this cognitive dissonance in their head uh, because of all the, the propaganda and, and all the mainstream media television programming and the movies about all the valiant cops that that don't ever exist in real life. If there's ever been more than one or two, I've never heard of them. Uh, and so uh, the real way to change things is to get this information out there. And I know, Edward, I don't know if you want to talk more on the police state issue, but if not, uh, why don't you let people know about your book? Because it's a great book that they should also check out. Oh, cool. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's, it's also on the same topic. It's called uh, Private Governance. I just happened to 
carry a copy wherever I go. Um, but uh, it's published by Oxford University Press. And I go through and talk about the history of private rules and regulations and, and, and a bit about their private enforcement as well. Uh, just to point out that there's not this bifurcation of you've got to choose government order or disorder. In fact, there's uh, tons of examples right now in hi in, and in history of privately produced order. I would suggest uh, all order uh, that we see today in things like stock markets, advanced uh, electronic markets, come about because of private rules and regulations. It's not because of Dodd-Frank. It's not because of uh, Elizabeth Warren. I don't think their understanding of markets is that good. Uh, but we do have order, and uh, things work fairly well. And I, I go through and talk about actual examples of private enforcement. And so to talk about some of the policing issues, uh, we have everything from uh, eyes on the street, which is Jane Jacobs' phrase about how cities are kept safe simply by having people look around and say, you know, well, I know what you're doing. Uh, we're we're going to observe uh, the, the neighborhood. Uh, to more formal things. So you've got examples of unarmed, stationary, private security guards. Uh, you've got, in certain cases, armed private security guards. And in, in, in many cases, you even have fully deputized private security guards, uh, sorry, private police. So in uh, Harvard and MIT, these great bastions of, of uh, free markets, they hire their own uh, fully deputized private police. And I, and I say if private police is good enough for Harvard and MIT, it should be good enough for the rest of us. And uh, to say, look, we don't need to be relying on uh, police that are hired and funded by the, the state, by taxpayer monopoly, when in many cases we can see pr plenty of examples of them being uh, done privately. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're going to be speaking at the upcoming Anarchapoca Conference, which is February 25th to 28th, 2017. It's going to be absolutely massive. We've got a new hotel. Uh, it's a five-star hotel. It's uh, unbelievable. It's going to be amazing. So many great speakers coming down. We've got, of course, Larkin Rose, Jeffrey Tucker, Lauren Southern of Rebel Media does a really interesting job against sort of the, the SJW movement. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, who just got kicked off of Twitter. Uh, Adam Kokesh, of course. Uh, Julia Taransky, Luke Grudowski, Ken O'Keefe. Keith, Roger Veer, the Bitcoin Jesus, I could go on and on, Max Egan, Zen Gardner, Barry Cooper, who actually was an ex-drug cop who uh, turned against fighting against the war on drugs, uh, amazing guy who actually lives down here in Mexico now, and so many others, and you're going to be speaking there, so I hope you bring down some books. We're going to have a, an Arcapulco bookstore there with all the authors. So many of these people who are speaking have also written books, and hopefully you can do a signed uh, a book signing of your book right, at the uh, conference. I'd love to. Sounds great. All right, so we'll see you down here in a few months. About I don't even know how much. I can't add very well. I went to public school, but I think about <laughs> six months, seven months from now. Uh, so we'll see you down here. Uh, so yeah, if you like this video, please, especially if you got a lot of uh, uh, what do they call them, cop suckers out there, people who love the cops, a bunch of bootlickers, those sort of conservatives who really love their cops. Uh, send them this video. It's going to piss them off, but who cares? We got to say something to these people at some point. Uh, they're ruining so many people's lives. Uh, so please like, subscribe, and share uh, this video. Uh, so people get access to it. Check out Narcopoco coming up at the end, end of February with so many free market thinkers, so many people about all these issues about private governance uh, that uh, really can happen and, are, and actually are happening uh, right now. It's a really actually exciting time. We're at a real sort of a watermark in, in this uh, move away from statism, central planning, government to free markets. And we actually have a chance to do it. And uh, so you can check that all out there. So if you, like I said, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, share. That's how we can get this information out there so people can start to wait up because they don't seem to know what the real answers are and the answers are not more government uh, so that's it for anarchast your home for anarchy on the internet peace love and anarchy from alcapulco mexico this is anarchast